attended SFAI, the San Francisco Art Institute, um, for her MFA in 2005. Um, she received um, her BFA, the Bachelor's of Fine Arts from Concordia University in Montreal, and also attended the Slade School of Art in London. Um, exhibitions um, at the Eleanor Har Harwood Gallery in San Francisco, um, as well as Larry Becker Contemporary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and at NAFTA Schultz Gallery in Chicago. Um, if you could, please um, give a really great welcome to Mel Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I recently became a fan of Emily Dickinson's poetry in particular, her envelope poems. I was taken by the visuality of these works, the delicacy of her script, the fragility of the paper, how it has aged and torn, a document from another era. Her corrections on the envelopes are made visible, allowing us to see her writing process. Erasure marks, gestural dashes, lines through words, underlines, make up the structure of these poems. These corrections are the visible effect of an altered consciousness, and the aesthetics of this act is what I am most interested in. Of course, the poems themselves are astonishing, with such truthful verses as, in this short life that only lasts an hour, how much, how little is within our power, or the humorous and factual, the mushroom is the elf of plants. But what I most respond to in this new body of paintings, and I'll pull up uh, a painting right here, is the aesthetics of the poems. Each mark in these new paintings, like each word for Dickinson, has to be specific. As in Dickinson, every correction is an attempt at getting closer to the image in my head, a conversation between intuition and consciousness. In every brushstroke, I believe it to be the right mark. Any corrections that come after were because the mark failed to answer the question I was posing. Um, here is another painting. Um, this one's quite small, so it's 20 by 24 inches. And I wanted to take you through uh, a three-stage process of one painting. So this is the kind of the first session of a painting. You can see it's very loose. Uh, there's some elements of drawing in it as well. and then some, uh, some graphic marks, a little bit more alterations. And this is where the painting is at right now. Again, um, this is kind of like a midway point of a painting. And then the corrections made to it. And this is where that painting is at right now. And I'm not sure if that one is finished, but I just thought it would be useful for me to show you kind of how I'm arriving at making forms in the painting. Um, here's another example. It's at the midway point. Definitely not finished, so needs work, definitely. Just like Dickinson's approach to texts on the envelope, her division of space, her own particular ordering of prose, her proclivity to form, I am making these paintings aware that a specific order and an inherent language of my own would lead to my ultimate goal, an insert which is an insertion of space that becomes greater in scale and scope by the treatment 
of the complexity of the layers. What does this mean? It means I am looking for a quality in these paintings that could be described as full of air, yet full of vital information. Full of color, but with restraint, in that the color functions under the surface to create a vibrating intensity. A seductive quality to the brushwork that makes us think about the material of paint, but I also want mystery. A quality in the work that can go beyond language and is purely experiential. A theme in these poems, as in these new paintings, from an aesthetic point of view, is what I would call pentimenti, a term used in painting that describes the visible act of changing one's mind, derived from the Italian word pentersi, meaning to repent. Pentimenti refers to an alteration to a painting evidenced by traces of previous work, showing that the artist has changed their mind during the painting process. Pentimenti does not refer to mistakes or to changes in the subject matter, but rather a deliberate modification to the composition. These changes are usually hidden beneath a subsequent layer of paint. In old paintings, they can be detected using infrared technology and x-ray. From as early as the Arnolfini marriage portrait, we can see evidence of pentimenti. We know that the artist, Van Eyck, corrected the position of Mr. Arnolfini's right hand. I don't know if you guys can see that clearly, but the hand on the left is a little bit more open-handed, open and the one on the right is the one that the artist went for. It's a little bit more pious in character, I would say. Formally, a disruption in a picture can be as engaging as all other aspects in the overall composition. Perhaps one can argue that the disruption engages the viewer even further. In this Piero de la Francesca mural in Arezzo that depicts the legend of the true cross, we see that an earthquake damaged the works and then was repaired in this way. What does the disruption do to the work, and how do we now experience it? Well, we know that Piero de la Francesca was also a mathematician. His paintings seek the link between an organic and a geometric basis for beauty. The repaired murals creates a new dialogue, the accidental and chaotic with the rational and mathematical in an allegorical setting. Beautifully, the murals now become examples of mankind in all his complexity, faith, rationale, and chaos. Other examples of disruption in painting can be seen in the Fayum mummy portraits. Time has taken their toll on these, decaying the supports and sometimes the image itself. These paintings emerged in Rome-occupied Egypt and were commissioned by artists to capture a likeness of the deceased. The intent was for the portraits never to be seen, a purely functional art, a visual passport to send the dead on their journey. And here you see um, an installation of the portrait on the mummy. If anybody has any questions, just feel free to yell it out. In response to these formal disruptions, I made these paintings on found wood. Manipulating these supports before, during, and after the painting process by hammering, ripping, and sanding which forces a characteristic in them that could be described as a violence and a purposeful aging process. And uh, just a side note, these works are uh, quite small. I would say no bigger than um, 12 by 16 inches. Here is a work on marble 
Um, marble is a very interesting material to, to work with. It's inherently luminous. And so the light just uh, kind of comes through it. And it's a very porous material. So um, it's, it's kind of a pleasure to work on. It makes painting very easy, actually. These works then quite naturally took on a delicate appearance. I believe in the inherent quality of oppositions. With violence comes fragility. To know light, we must understand darkness. When these opposing forces come together, it is called contradiction and is essential to understand and accept when making paintings. This important work of art resulted from a dialogue between the Dada artist Robert Rauschenberg and the abstract expressionist William de Kooning. Rauschenberg asked de Kooning to gift him a drawing, revealing to the great master what his intention was, which was to erase it. De Kooning understood the act and gave over a drawing from his woman series. Only pentimento traces of the original drawing remain. Rauschenberg does not call this a negation, a negation of the original, but rather a celebration of it, a positive gesture. Critics, on the other hand, deem this work as the moment that ended the abstract expressionist movement. And um, this is uh, the title and the description. If you look back here, you can see in the bottom center, uh, this is what it says. Erased de Kooning drawing, Robert Rauschenberg, 1953. I think since this moment, the act of erasure and the canceling out of information is part of the visual dialogue in contemporary art. But it may have different intentions. One would be using it to make a space for ourselves within the history of art, to willfully cancel or remove the burden of history, forging a new path and form, using historical subject matter as an anchor to be distinct. Another reason for this style may be a more intimate and psychological pursuit, making corrections to achieve what is believed to be perfect in its specificity, as we see with Dickinson. Um, this is a little painting I made uh, probably four years ago. It's very small. It's maybe 12 by 12 inches. And uh, I want it to be very clear and literal about contradiction in this painting. So I set up something kind of open-handed and washy. And I put something hard and graphic on top of it. Also, there's the notion of landscape, sea and sky, and a representation, and then the canceling out of that representation, kind of like forming a dialogue between representational painting and abstract painting. Undeniably, erasure and correction has been an ongoing theme in my paintings. What are my reasons for using these devices in my work? Most explanations can never be as simple as just the one thing. I think it may have something to do with aspiring towards an accumulated, unified arrival to something. And along the way, the searching for this goal. To be visible, including the viewer in this activity. It is both the act of digging and refining over and over to arrive at a very well-posed question. This action, to dig, to refine, can take on different speeds, use an, use an infinite array of marks, can occupy whole picture planes, and have different emotional outputs. Humor, urgency, hesitation, accident, Sometimes I pay respect to the canon. Sometimes I want distance from it. Sometimes both in the same painting. Uh, 
Um, here is a painting entitled uh, When He Pulls Back on the Oars. And I kind of wanted this action of a forward and a backward movement, something really definitive. So the first layers are really thin and then taken away, canceled out so that you could see the original linen. Um, and then finally this uh, loose gestural crossover, which has been masked off. Like, I, I see this painting as like a forward movement and a backward movement. Um, here is a painting uh, that is somewhat anecdotal for me. I um, had put down some paint, and it wasn't working out. I'd put a pattern down, and I just got frustrated with it. So I, I poured some spirits on the paint, on the painting, left for the day, and came back the next morning, and uh, this is where it was. It was just kind of like a really beautiful, happy accident. So I like the idea of something took place in... I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, a lot of these paintings tend to start off with a pattern, and then I would disrupt the pattern with um, open-handed gesture marks, and sometimes even masking off these gesture marks and, and taking them away, and then... Um, putting a hard graphic that echoes the original pattern. Robert Ryman works a dialogue between the ground and the surface, building up modifications and amendments, and ultimately a metamorphosis of materials. His work is a refined, nuanced, and utterly specific altered composition. Emptying out the picture plane of all imagery, his work uses found materials, some as banal as fasteners and tape that serve both a practical and aesthetic purpose. Neither abstract nor entirely monochromatic, Ryman's paintings are paradoxically realistic. Julian Schnabel is a painter that uses art historical imagery and photography as a ground for his paintings. Text. Loose gestural marks make responses to his outsourced layers. The result is a theme of duality, the past with now, the austere appropriated grounds with open-handed organic marks. What does the second interaction do? Aside from a formal juxtaposition, it invades a familiar space. It disrupts an idea. Disruption has become part of the language in contemporary painting. Gerhard Richter's squeegee paintings dissolve the paint, rendering the surface an accumulation of incoherent information. The paint has been confused over and over to create an abstraction from what was originally applied. The act of pushing the paint, eking out a result, reminds me of a mutation that can only happen through observation and labor over and over. The distortion in Richter's paintings may speak about several topics. It is possible that it reflects the tech media noise we are all experiencing. It may pose the question, what is the image that can exist in the 21st century, and that this is the answer to it? Or it may have to do with how we experience images now, the blur of the lens, the speed in which we process pictures. Or it could have some <clears throat> Excuse me, or it could simply be a formal response to the problem of paint on a surface. No shape, no narrative, no form, just a visual experience. In this body of work where the subject matter is loosely based on foliage, I think I did these paintings uh, 2012. A different set of devices is used to create subtleties. Foliage became a way to apply mystery into the work, controlling what I wanted to hide and what, would I, what I was willing to reveal. 
Uh, here is a painting that is based on uh, a poem by Kay Ryan, and I hope you don't mind. I was going to read it to you. Uh, it is very short, so do not fret. Um, the poem is called Cloud. A blue stain creeps across the deep pile of the evergreens. From inside the forest, it seems like an interior matter, something wholly to do with trees, a color passed from one to another, a requirement to which they submit unflinchingly, like soldiers or brave people getting older. Then the sun comes back, and it's totally over. I was interested in describing a fleeting moment in a painting, something very transitional. And so that's why this transparent shade uh, was used. Um, it's kind of like this graphic, but in a very subtle way. Information behind the foliage is as important as what is in front. Foliage is an ideal subject matter because of its natural connection with light and infinite shapes. Um, here is a painting that I made. It's a fun little painting that's based on a Matisse painting, which I'm about to show you. This painting. Um, so I thought it would be fun to interpret something having to do with the figure, and right before a violent act, it, it feels like, with foliage. And I put it in this theatrical setting because of the um, allegorical nature of the original painting. I'm excited about chromatic vibrations that touch all surfaces and layers, making a plane that is full of lush descriptions of the natural world. I was curious to make paintings where the subject matter is decidedly decorative. Subject matter in a painting can be an excuse to how to structure a composition, how to pose questions, solve formal problems, an armature to hang paint on. Subject matter can be the least interesting aspect of the work. What can be most compelling is the content of a work, not what is depicted, but what the work is doing. These larger foliage paintings are great examples of using pentimenti as a style. The slight perpetual tweakings of color and form allow for the painting overall to pulsate. Pentimenti adds to the claustrophobic nature of the spaces in these paintings. Now, this is a painting called Ceiling, because um, as I finished it, I felt that I had created this <coughs> space where instead of, of it being flat, the viewer was looking up into a rooftop. Um, here is a painting I wanted to show you. This is um, kind of an early stage of this painting. And I was so precious about the, this, <laughs> this part of the painting, which occupied uh, quite literally the center of the composition. And I did everything I could to keep this form in the painting. It's, I see it as kind of like a chrysalis. And I don't know exactly how I painted it. And it was a mystery to me. But I thought it was very beautiful. Um, so I tried everything I could, and I painted around it, but it just absolutely did not work. And so I finally had to get rid of it. And this is where the painting is at right now. And here's a detail of that painting. Here is a painting by Matisse, and it alters the way I think about space, using pattern to push the edges of the picture plane making the image seem wholly larger. The room's interior stretches to the outdoors. The bold diagonal marks reach both floor and wall, creating a dynamic and contemporary feel. Although flat in description, Matisse creates a convincing room that the viewer could occupy. In this painting of mine entitled Reflection, 
I try to do just that using a set of horizontal marks, if you see from here up. Making a reflection, like as you see in water or even a staircase, where the viewer um, is invited to enter into the landscape. The figure, um, I feel, is besides the point, and that's why I turned it upside down using it purely for formal, uh, as a formal device. And here's a detail of that painting. And that's it, thank you. Mm. Hi there. Um, yes, they're 36 by 48. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, absolutely. I think um, it's mostly affected it probably palette-wise. Um, the paintings I was doing in Canada were obviously a little bleak. And then when I went to London, I don't know if you know of British painters at all, but um, the work tends to be kind of muddy in palette, if we think about Auerbach or Nicholson. Um, and then when I moved out to the Bay Area, the, my palette became ignited, very lush and full of color. Yeah, yeah v very much responding to the light in the Bay Area. Richard Smith. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know him. Yes, always. I see poetry as doing what painting does, uh, but just with words, that just working with metaphors, trying to describe the world around us or the human experience, but always the problem of metaphor, how to describe it through metaphor, and painting does that also. I think it's the idea. I mean, I, I'm um, astonished by the language um, and the style of the prose, but I'm always looking for a truth in a poem, you know, something that really resonates with me, something that I could learn from, the idea behind the poem. Yeah. Not always. It's not always as literal as that. Sometimes I allow the truth to, I experience the, that truth in the poem, and then I let it influence my painting. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? Yes. You might, I, you know, I really love the images you show of other artists' work and how you, you know, and in the poetry, you feel like there's this relationship between something that you discover and comment on. Do you sort of have associates that you feel like you know other artists that you keep in a lot of contact with and really influence your work, like close to home? Yeah, I'm in dialogue with uh, a few other painters. Um, uh, a painter that I really like is an L.A. painter. His name is uh, John Millay, and uh, he uses poetry as well to influence his work. And so um, you should check out his work. He's a very good painter. Yeah. Did, an did that answer your question? Well, I was kind of curious if there's, if there's thinking of the original Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there are not many people who want to communicate with me about poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Not, it's it's kind of like 
I feel like poets have it really hard, uh, more so than painters. Um, it's so idiosyncratic and it's really thankless. Um, but just on a practical level, if you're looking for like a little dose of truth, it's just, it's just really fruitful, do you know? And it, no, just to read a poem. Um, I don't think people do it, um, which is why I say people don't really want to talk to me about poetry. Um, but it, it's, what's that? I don't know, probably. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. And and maybe this is helpful for like some of the painters potentially like um, thinking through um, the palette choices and also um, the reference like in the work like if you're working from observation or not or it's I know it's more about the idea of a plant. Yes. Um, in the end result, it's more about the idea of the plant than something from observation. But do you feel like Yeah, um, up until these foliage paintings, it was very much of my imagination. So it was a really intuitive act. And then with the foliage paintings, I needed to do some drawings just to figure out um, what foliage looks like because that, that set of paintings were more representational. Um, so a lot of drawings took place, a lot of, uh, and then from the drawings, drawing onto canvas, and then um, always kind of altering that drawing, not really happy with the original composition. I think composition in painting is the toughest to nail. I mean, it's, I, I think artists who don't address composition, they're kind of, they're not stepping up. And so composition for me is like, a, the thing that I battle with most in the studio and the composition can change over and over and over and over and sometimes I arrive back to where I originated and you know but I need that's where all that alteration and where all that trial comes from and probably the most uh, engaging process in my studio once I know I nailed the composition I feel kinda home free and that the painting is close uh, to being finished then it's just about tweaking chroma or things like that does that answer your question? It does. Um, did, this is like a follow-up question really quickly. Um, did, when you're building the palette for the painting, yeah. do, they, do they typically start very reduced and then they become more complex like the last thing you showed us? Yeah. Or um, yeah, very reduced in order to control things, do you know? Um, so at most two or three colors. Um, I was taught to use a very, like in school, I was taught to use a very neutral color, like a burnt umber, to get the drawing down, to get it all mapped out, and then to build from there. Um, I find that kind of boring, because it's not my favorite color, so I would indulge and use like two or three colors. And then knowing that I could tweak it later, you know, yeah. Any more questions? Thank you very much.